Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Many years ago, I heard a story that seemed too strange to believe, but as I began to read more about it, I found out it was all true. I've said this before, but it always bears repeating. Real life is often much more incredible than any fiction, and this story is a great example of just how incredible it can be. So many things had to line up perfectly or imperfectly, however you choose to look at it, in order for these events to have taken place. From a father who hired a stranger to assist him, not knowing what that stranger had planned, to a little girl who had more strength and fortitude than most, it all comes together in one of the most shocking and unusual stories of death and survival I have ever heard. This is the story of Terry Jo Duperalt, the sea orphan. Let's get into it. November 1961. For years, Arthur Duperalt had dreamed of sailing and of taking his family on sailing trips around the world with him. Arthur was born in 1921 and was 41 years old. He was a successful and wealthy optometrist from Green Bay, Wisconsin, with a thriving practice and by all accounts, a wonderful life. He was well off, but he wasn't super rich, so he had been saving for years to be able to afford a dream sailing vacation. Arthur's wife was named Jean. She was 38 years old, and together the couple had three children, Brian, who was 14, Terry Jo, who was 11, and little redheaded Renee, who was seven. I have an affinity for redheads because I have a little redhead. We have red hair that runs in my family and little redheaded kids just kind of melt my heart and this is a sad story. Arthur had been long planning a trip for his family, but they weren't going to just pack the car and drive to a national park or to Disney World. Arthur wanted a true sailing experience, and he knew he would need help. He wasn't a practiced and experienced sailor, but he was determined to become one and thought the best way to do that would to be find a knowledgeable sailor to guide him. Arthur had become acquainted with a man by the name of Julian Harvey. Julian was 44 years old at the time. He was handsome, he was well-liked, he was in great physical condition, and he was a very experienced sailor. Julian had flown in the Air Force for 16 years. He had been on missions in Africa, Europe, and the South Pacific during World War II, and had received commendations for inventing training procedures on how to hide planes after they had been forced down in an emergency landing. Julian then served in the Korean War and flew 114 missions during that conflict. He was a decorated officer. He had an air medal with eight oak leaf clusters, and he had a DFC with cluster. Julian was a fitness fanatic. He had washboard abs and curly hair, and sometimes he had a little bit of a stutter, which seemed to only add to his charm. People liked Julian. They admired him. He was a fixture around the Florida ports where he worked as a captain on chartered yachts and boats. He was well known on the yachting scene, and he was usually paid well for his services. As I read about Julian, a couple of things stood out in my mind. The first was the stutter. Even though people seem to see that as part of Julian's charm, I look at it through a different lens because of all the true crime research I've done. It is quite common for people, usually men, to grow up harboring a lot of anger if they have a stutter as a child. Robert Hansen, John O'Brien, Pierre Lebrun, David Carpenter, the trailside killer, they all stuttered. Now, of course, that does not mean that men who stutter are more violent than other men, generally speaking. But stuttering is such a prevalent feature of men who become violent as adults that FBI profiler, the granddaddy, John Douglas, spent quite a bit of time researching and forming opinions on men who stutter that become violent later in life. So knowing this, I found it interesting that in articles dating back to the 1960s, Julian's stutter was mentioned in several of those, and that was long before John Douglas ever had the notion of profiling or studying serial killers. The second thing that struck me about Julian Harvey is this. The more I learn about not just true crime stories, but about life in general, the more I believe this. There is a class of person who likes to hang around people with money, but that don't have money. 
or perhaps they are thrown into the world of people with money because of their job. Think of like golf pros, for example. They might be a great golfer, and so they're in the world of golf, which is, of course, a rich person's sport. But as a golf pro, they're making maybe $100,000 a year. It's a nice wage, but nothing compared to the millions the people they work with are worth. Now, of course, there are people who can work amongst the rich and never harbor any resentment, but I think there is a class of people who really dislike the people that they work for. Julian Harvey, because of his vast military experience, knew he could make a living in the world of yachting. But as an employee, as a servant to the very wealthy, that might not bother a lot of people. But like I said, there is this small portion of the group, in my opinion, who do not like the people they're forced to work with. They stay in that profession because they have to, or maybe because they're always hoping one of these super rich people will give them some kind of an opening into that world and they can make more money, right? but they secretly harbor resentment and hate the fact that they're more knowledgeable, more skilled, more intelligent perhaps than the rich people that they work for. Julian Harvey strikes me as one of those people. Now, of course, I didn't know him, but that's the feeling I get when researching him. These are always just my opinions and I'm not a cop, I'm not an attorney, I'm not somebody that's prosecuting a case, I'm just here to share my opinions and talk to you guys about yours on these cases. This is a community, we like to discuss these kinds of things. So Arthur Duperald and Julian Harvey are acquainted. I couldn't find a definitive answer on how they met. Like I said earlier, Arthur had been saving for years to take the sailing trip and he knew he wanted to do it in the winter time so the family could escape the cold and harsh winters of Wisconsin. Finally, in November of 1961, Arthur was ready for the adventure of a lifetime. He had been speaking with Julian for some time about the trip and the two made plans to meet up in Fort Lauderdale. The family was going to go to Florida to make this trip happen. The Duperalt family left their home in Wisconsin and traveled to Florida to meet up with Julian and his wife, Mary Dean. Julian and Mary had only been married for a few months, and they were both very excited about the opportunity to take a sailing vacation, especially a sailing vacation they were being paid to work on. Julian was going to act as the skipper of the boat, and Mary was going to help with the meals and the cleaning and the children. Now, Mary Dean was Julian Harvey's sixth wife. Yes, I said six. She was an aspiring writer and former stewardess. Julian was going to be paid $100 a day for his services. That's a little over $1,000 a day in today's money. So it was a good gig for Julian. Arthur chartered this boat, the Blue Bell, a 60-foot twin-masted sailing catch based in Fort Lauderdale. The plan was for the family to sail to the Bahamas and spend about a week there before sailing back to the States. Everyone was excited and anxious and very much looking forward to the trip of a lifetime. They packed the Bluebell with food and water and supplies and all the luggage they had brought with them and they prepared to leave. November 8th, 1961. It was a Wednesday when the family set sail for the Bahamas. Other sailors and dock employees saw the boat leave the port on the afternoon of the 8th, and several remember waving to the family on board as the Bluebell departed. The family sailed to Bimini and then to Sandy Point. The Duperalts were having the time of their lives. They walked on the beaches and they purchased souvenirs. They rented snorkeling equipment and hired some locals to teach them how to use it. By all accounts, they were having a fantastic time. On November 12th, Arthur and Julian visited the office of the British District Commissioner, a man named Roderick Pinder, and Arthur told him, this has been a once-in-a-lifetime vacation. We'll be home before Christmas. That evening, the family boarded the Bluebell, and Mary Dean made a meal of chicken cacciatore for the family. After dinner, Terry Jo got ready to go off to bed. Terry Jo remembers that the Harveys were on deck with her parents as she turned in for the night. On Monday, November 13th, just a day after Arthur and Julian had visited with the British District Commissioner, an oil tanker called the Gulf Lion was sailing through the area and an employee on board was standing on the deck at about 12.30 in the afternoon when he saw a dinghy drifting towards the oil tanker. In the dinghy was a man frantically waving his arms and shouting. The dinghy got closer and closer to the oil tanker and the man in the dinghy yelled to the men on board the oil freighter, help, I have a dead baby on board. 
The men aboard the oil tanker lowered the ropes and lifted the man from the dinghy onto the deck of the ship. In the dinghy, they could see the body of a small red-headed girl in a life jacket, and she was dead. Once the man from the dinghy was aboard, he told the sailors that his name was Julian Harvey. He explained to them that he had been hired to captain a sailboat for a family on vacation. He claimed that the night before, at about 8.30, there was a sudden and violent squall, and he was unable to keep the sailboat from capsizing. He said they were between the Abaco Islands and Great Stirrup Cay when the squall hit, that the boat keeled over and the mainmast snapped. He said his wife got hurt when the boat keeled, and that the broken mast pierced the hull of the ship. Julian continued on to tell the sailors that the fallen mast and the resultant loose rigging pulled down the mizzen. Julian said he ran to the galley to retrieve some wire cutters to begin cutting away the rigging, but that a fire broke out in the kitchen. As the boat burned and keeled, Julian claims he was separated from the other people on the boat and that all he was able to do was get himself into the dinghy. He said once he was floating alone, he saw the body of little Renee float by and he grabbed her up out of the water and attempted CPR on her. He was unable to revive Renee and said he kept her body on board out of respect. And it was later determined that Renee died of drowning. Julian Harvey was taken to Nassau where he underwent questioning by authorities. Right off the bat, there was some suspicion because the dinghy was filled with food and water and other things Julian would need to survive if left at sea for days. Why was he able to grab so many items of supply to assist him, but he was unable to assist any of the other people on board? But the more authorities listened to Julian's story, they realized it seemed plausible. They couldn't disprove anything he was saying. They also knew his record and were fully aware that he was a knowledgeable and experienced sailor. Not only that, he was a decorated military man. On November 15th, Julian was released and allowed to go back to Florida. By this time, the word of the horrific tragedy had spread back to the United States. People were shocked and grieving the loss of this little family. They couldn't believe that a wonderful family vacation had turned into such a nightmare and they couldn't believe that the entire family had been lost. Not only had they been lost, Julian's wife, Mary Dean, was lost too, and Julian was grieving her death, telling the media outlets and reporters that he was heartbroken. Julian Harvey was lauded as a survivor and a hero and a victim, and people sent words of sympathy. The news reported on the tragedy, and well-wishers sent cards and money to Julian as he recovered from the ordeal and as he grieved the loss of his beautiful new wife and the entire Duperalt family, with whom he had become friends. Julian Harvey told the media that he needed some time to grieve and that he would find a way to move on with his life. Little did Julian Harvey know his life was about to come to an end because against all odds, someone had survived and she had an entirely different story to tell. November 16th, 1961. A Greek freighter named Captain Theo was sailing near the Bahamas on its usual route. Second officer Nicholas Spachidakis saw something floating in the distance. As the freighter moved along, Nicholas was shocked to see that it was a small cork float, not even a raft, but a mesh net with cork around it, and sitting on the edge was a young girl. He could not believe his eyes. Nicholas shouted at the other sailors to come and help him. The captain of the freighter ordered that the engines be stopped. Once the freighter stopped moving, a life raft was lowered down to the girl and she was brought on board the ship. The tiny float the girl was sitting on was only two feet by five feet in size. The men were surprised and wanted to ask the girl her story, but she was so weak she couldn't even speak. Her face was blistered from the sun and her feet were bloody and torn up because fish had been biting them. The girl wasn't even able to sit down in the mesh on the cork float. She was forced to sit on the little edge of the cork float as you can see here in the photo. The girl was wearing a white blouse and pink corduroy pants, and she was very near death. The sailors immediately gave the girl water and orange juice to try to hydrate her. They gathered wet towels to begin washing the salt off of her body, and they applied Vaseline to her lips, which were swollen and cracked from the sun and from dehydration. 
After about 20 minutes, the girl seemed to perk up a little bit. She was able to whisper that her boat had sunk and her family was gone, and she told them that her name was Terry Jo Duperalt. But not long after that, Terry began to slip in and out of consciousness and she stopped speaking. She was able to kind of wave her hand when asked a question, but she was weak and desperately needed medical attention. The sailors didn't bother to retrieve the tiny cork float the girl had been sitting on, but it was found a few days later after her rescue and it couldn't even be picked up in one piece. It had been disintegrating as Terry Jo sat on it and it was almost dissolved. The captain of the freighter got online with the Coast Guard and they sent a rescue helicopter for Terry Jo. She was loaded on board and taken to a hospital in Miami for treatment. As Terry Jo was receiving emergency care in Miami, Julian Harvey was arriving at police headquarters for a second interview with authorities in America. On November 17th, Julian sat down to begin answering more questions. In the middle of the interview, an officer came into the interrogation room and informed the officers and Julian that a girl had just been found floating in the ocean and that she had been rescued and life flighted to a Miami hospital where she was alive and receiving treatment. Julian Harvey's face went blank and the color drained from his face. He fell silent for a moment and then tried to recover, saying, oh my God, isn't that wonderful? He then asked investigators if he could leave. He said that he wasn't feeling very well and that he wanted to speak with his wife's family to tell them the news. The investigators allowed Julian to leave. Julian was not going to speak with his wife's family. He left the interrogation room and drove to the Sandman Motel on Biscayne Boulevard. He paid for a room with cash and checked in under the name of John Monroe. Julian then spent some time writing a two-page suicide letter. When he was finished, he went into the bathroom of his motel room and slashed his thighs, ankles, and jugular with a razor. Two hours later, he was found by a maid. Julian Harvey was dead. His note was addressed to a friend that Julian served in the military with. It didn't offer an explanation or a reason. Instead, it simply said, I got tired and nervous. I couldn't stand it any longer. The note asked that his body be buried at sea and that his friend take care of Julian's 14-year-old son, Lance. Immediately, Julian's friends came forward telling authorities and the media that his suicide was the result of just one too many tragedies and a difficult life. They said this final loss, the loss of his sixth wife, Mary Dean, must have pushed him over the edge. Friends relayed stories of how Julian once survived a terrible car crash that killed his second wife and her mother. They said he had twice been forced to parachute from planes in order to save his own life, and that he had a lot of trauma from the wars he served in. After Julian retired from the Air Force, a boat he was on went down and he had to be rescued by helicopter. Three years after that terrible event, Julian's own powerboat, called the Valiant, sunk in the Gulf of Mexico and he had barely escaped with his life. Friends and family said this last tragedy just sent Julian over the edge. The culmination of all the terrible things he had endured was simply too much for him. But all these things were said before Julian's friends heard Terry Jo Duperalt's story. For two days, Terry Jo lay in bed, barely able to speak. But on the third day, after hydration and treatment for sunstroke and other ailments, she began to speak. Most people assumed that she would tell a story of a terrible storm at sea and a sinking boat that resulted in her predicament. Well, that was not at all what Terry Jo said happened. On November 20th, 1961, it was determined that Terry Jo was strong enough to give an official statement and she was interviewed. She told investigators that around nine o'clock on November 12th, she went down into the lower cabin to go to sleep. When she did, her father and mother were on the deck of the sailboat with Julian and Mary. Terry Jo's brother Brian and her little sister Renee were also still on deck. Terry Jo fell asleep in her cabin and later in the night was awakened by screaming. She could hear her brother Brian calling and yelling for his father to come and help. Terry Jo then heard footsteps storming across the deck of the sailboat, and so she got out of bed and began to climb the few steps to go up on the deck and see what was happening. As Terry Jo got up onto the next level, she was shocked to see the bodies of her mother Jean and her brother Brian laying on the floor of the main cabin, which was close to the kitchen. There was blood all around them. Terry Jo continued walking to the deck where she saw Julian 
She tried to ask him what was going on and what had happened to her mother and brother. Julian was carrying a metal bucket, and when he saw Terry Jo, he hit her with it and then yelled at her, get back down there. Terry Jo was, of course, terrified. She asked him, is the boat sinking? And Julian snapped at her, yes. Terry Jo ran back to her cabin and closed the door. She stood there quietly for about 15 minutes, not sure what was happening or what to do. She must have been frozen in fear. It's just a terrible thing for a child to have to endure. After a few minutes, Terry Jo saw and felt water, and then she smelled oil on the floor of her cabin. Still, she stood frozen, not knowing what to do. Suddenly, Julian burst into her cabin and he was carrying a rifle. The two looked at each other and Terry Jo thought Julian was going to shoot her, but for some reason he didn't. Later, of course, she realized that wouldn't have worked with his story in case Terry Jo's body was ever found. Julian knew he couldn't shoot her. How would he explain that as part of his storm story? So Julian simply turned and walked away. Terry Jo then heard metal on metal, kind of hammering sounds. She knew she couldn't just wait any longer, so she left her cabin a second time. And this time, she saw Julian standing on the deck, lowering the dinghy into the water. Julian had the nerve to turn to Terry Jo and ask her, is the dinghy loose? Meaning, is it clear for me to use? Terry Jo replied, I don't know. Julian then told Terry Jo to hold the rope that was attached to the dinghy while he went and got some things he needed. I mean, the audacity. Of course, Terry Jo didn't know what his plans were or what was happening. I'm sure she was so confused. Julian walked away to get what he was after, and then when he came back, probably because she was in shock, Terry had let go of the rope, and the dinghy was slowly floating away from the sailboat. So Julian saw this, and he went to the edge of the deck and dove in the water. He swam to the dinghy and got inside, leaving Terry Jo to die on the sinking ship. Terry Jo called out for her family, but no one answered, and I think she knew she was alone and had to save herself. This is a smart girl and a girl that paid attention, and Terry Jo remembered that there was a small white cork float attached to the side of the deck. She went to it and untied the small float just as the sailboat's deck was submerged. The boat was sinking and she had to get off of it. I couldn't help but put myself in Terry Joe's place. Imagine how dark it was. Imagine how quiet it was. You're a child sitting alone on this tiny life raft in the middle of the black ocean. Your entire family is dead, you're assuming, and you're now totally and completely alone, floating in the middle of the sea. I mean, that is just nightmare fuel to me. It's unimaginable. And I also thought about what the investigators must have been thinking and feeling as they listened to this horrible story. They must have been aghast, right? Terry Jo was then told that Julian had claimed there was a storm and a fire in the kitchen. Terry Jo said none of that happened. There was no storm. There was no fire. It was all a lie. She said the bluebell was intact and everything was fine that night when she went to bed and even when she first heard the screaming and went up on the deck. Terry said she floated on the little cork float for days. She said she had to sit straight up on the edge the entire time because the fish were biting her. She couldn't even lay down and sleep. At one point on the first night, Terry Jo said she did try and sleep on the edge of the float and she awoke abruptly as she fell into the water and she scrambled back onto the little float and from that point on realized it wasn't safe to sleep. Oh my goodness. I don't know how many 11 year old kids you've been around, but this is really impressive and really sad and shocking. 11, they're like in between being a little kid and being kind of a older kid, it's a very different age depending on the child. They can be very, very immature and juvenile or they can be quite mature. And luckily, Terry was very mature. Terry Jo said that she started to feel weak and sick and of course she was very hungry and very thirsty. She said she just sat on the little float praying that someone would help her. Letters of support began to flow in for Terry Jo. The media was clamoring at the hospital doors for a photo or an interview, and they began to call Terry Jo the sea orphan. The poor little girl had lost her entire family and had almost lost her own life. Terry Jo's aunt and uncle stepped forward and informed authorities they would take Terry Jo in and raise her as their own. She received lots of gifts and lots of love, and she started the long process of healing.
Meanwhile, authorities and the media began to look into Julian Harvey. He was far from the person he had always presented himself to be. I don't think any of us are shocked to find out about that. In December of 1961, Time magazine began to do some digging around. They found that after the car accident Julian survived, that his second wife was killed in, some of the investigators had concerns. The car had apparently struck the column of a bridge and then went into the water in Florida. Well, Julian somehow emerged from the car without a scratch on him because he had apparently jumped from the car before it went into the water. Investigators felt that would be pretty much impossible for someone to do unless they were already prepared to jump. Now again, Julian's second wife and her mother were killed in that accident, but there wasn't enough evidence to pursue charges against Julian. That ship that went down earlier in Julian's life, there were questions about that too. Julian's own friends found the circumstances of that shipwreck suspicious. Julian was paid almost $15,000 in insurance money for the loss of that boat and for his injuries. That's over $150,000 in today's money. So at this point, it's clear Julian Harvey was committing insurance fraud. After Julian was dead, some friends of his came forward and told authorities that Julian had confided in him that he had intentionally sunk his own boat, that boat called the Valiant, for the insurance money. It's wild that people used to be able to commit insurance fraud so blatantly. Here in St. George, I remember when I was really young, there was this guy who had a sports bar that we used to go and have dinner at. And I think that thing burned down like three times. The first time it burned down, everybody was like, oh, that's too bad. And it was in a shopping center and there were stores around it that didn't burn. But the second time it burned down, he totally rebuilt it. And then I think on the third time he ended up going to jail. I'm not 100% sure on that. I was like 22 or 23 at the time. But anyway, I think it's funny that people think they can get away with things like that. It was probably easier back then, right? Now everything's digitized and tracked more closely, but it's wild to me. Terry Jo recovered and went on to live a life surrounded by love in a wonderful home given to her by her aunt and uncle. She stayed totally out of the spotlight and very quiet for decades, never giving even a single interview to the media. She lived a normal life and participated in high school and then she went on to have children of her own. She is now retired and lives in Kewanee, Wisconsin. In 2010, Terry Jo wrote a book called Alone, orphaned on the ocean, and she did finally give an interview to CBS, which is copyrighted, so I can't show you any parts of that, unfortunately, but I will put a link to it in the description of this video. I'll tell you one thing, the older I get and the more I learn about history and about the nature of human beings, the less I'm shocked, but the more I'm often surprised at some of the astounding and incredible things that happen in our world. And this story of murder and survival is one of the most incredible I've ever come across. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. You know the drill. Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. And as always, you can join my Patreon. Yes, we need Patreon to keep the channel afloat, but in the end, the goal is to donate money to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that cannot be tested because there's no money to test it. We want to help with that. We want to help solve cold cases. So if you can join my Patreon, you'll be a part of that. Thanks so much for spending a little bit of your day with me today. I really look forward to our interaction. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.